Our next presentation will be uh, from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WBCSD. And what Anna will be covering will be what are the objectives and what are the links between WBCSD and the Open Footprint. A little bit about Anna. Anna Stanley is a manager at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And she leads the value chain carbon transparency pathfinder, which seeks to address the challenges surrounding scope three emissions transparency. So Anna, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Heidi, and uh, thank you for having me today. And good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to everyone joining us. Um, yeah, so Heidi has obviously already given you a short a short introduction to myself. Um, I think maybe one one more thing I'd like to share with you is is maybe my driving force for working in this space, so you get an idea of, of who I am and, and kind of why I'm working on this topic. Um, so I really have a strong desire to play my part in moving businesses uh, in the kind of yeah the entire world towards a more sustainable uh, place. Um, I'm really passionate about finding tangible solutions uh, to sustainability challenges and empowering individuals and businesses to be able to make the impact uh, that they should be having in order to, to help us transition. Um, and it's within this context that I've come to work with the WBCSD on this project on emissions transparency. Um, this, this project in my work at WBCSD is very closely aligned uh, with, yeah, with, this, with this goal because I work on enabling companies or giving companies the tools to accelerate their decarbonisation journey. Um, today, I wanted to kind of cover three different uh, different areas with you today, as Heidi already indicated a little bit. Uh, and I really wanted to the kind of the key takeaway for me really out of all of this today should be that collaboration in the climate space is one of the biggest and most important things that we can do. And in order to kind of bring this closer to you and, and to kind of yeah give my perspective on that, I would like to talk a little bit about the work we've done in the um, carbon transparency pathfinder that Heidi just mentioned. Um, the work we're just embarking on um, in the Carbon Transparency Partnership and also um, kind of the role that the Open Footprint um, initiative plays in this context. So maybe before I go to the details of that, um, I'd like to start with a little bit of context on uh, WBCSD um, and give you an idea if you're not familiar with the organization, um, yeah, to kind of just give you a quick insight. Um, Heidi, can I just ask you to move to the next slide, please? Uh, um, uh, you've got control of the slides. Oh, so I have control on them. Yeah, okay. if you take your cursor on the screen, you'll then be able to move the slides uh, with the arrows to the left of the screen, or with your space bar, should move them on one at a time. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I couldn't see that. Perfect. Um, yes, so uh, what is the WBCSD? Um, the WBCSD is a global CEO-led organization um, it's a kind of, I guess, a, yeah, a coalition of over 200 leading businesses which are working together to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world. Um, members from all different business sectors and all major economies are coming together in the WBCSD, and uh, we really have a strong, a strong presence with uh, revenues over uh, 18.5 trillion US dollars and uh, uh, a network also of 70 national world business councils that kind of come in addition to these stakeholders we work with uh, together. Um, and, you know, what the WBCSD provides is a unique platform to work on topics together to really drive change in specific areas. So we focus on a host of different areas which uh, enable the transition to a more sustainable world, reaching from a focus on circularity, uh, sustainable cities, um, social and kind of, yeah, I guess, social change, uh, food and agriculture, but also the climate and energy space within which I work. And the WBCSD also focuses quite strongly and has a very, a very strong rooting in the space of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, originally, back in the day when the greenhouse gas protocol um, that we heard about briefly earlier um, was, was founded, um, WBCSD was the original convener and together with WRI um, worked towards, uh, yeah, I guess, <laughs> putting it in place and, and, and um, developing it. Um, and this work has continued throughout the past years and with the, uh, the, the work that I now currently lead, um, we've really uh, taken the next step on the journey towards uh, working on emissions transparency and um, in the space of greenhouse gas emissions to ensure that we, we support this transition to a more sustainable, um, sustainable world. 
And the context in which all of this is really set is, and the project that, that I'd like to talk about today a little bit, is the fact that um, it's very clear that we're not actually on track at all to reach the 1.5 or even the 2, two degree target of the Paris Agreement. Um, the unit uh, program emissions gap report shows that very clearly that our efforts are insufficient and that we need to step up our game if uh, if we really want to uh, want to get ahead. Um, and part of that is, you know, the huge, a huge part of the emissions obviously uh, emanates from the business community. So there really is a, an amount of pressure which is building for, for business stakeholders to play their role um, to, to reduce their emissions and to accelerate the, what they're doing uh, in order to do so. Um, you know, there's pressures from the customer side in the sense that customers are increasingly demanding sustainable products, demanding to know the carbon footprint of their products, for example. Um, on the policy side of things, um, laws are being passed all over the place, uh, creating incentives, but also kind of, I guess, boundaries and, and, and things that need to be implemented within companies to ensure that that, uh, that that these these laws are met. Uh, one good example in Europe is the uh, European Green Deal. Um, but also, for example, um, there is a legislation coming uh, in about uh, in a couple of years time, about two years time, around a product around product environmental footprints um, and requirements uh, to display um, what what footprints your uh, your product uh, actually uh, causes. Um, and there's also huge uh, huge pressures from the uh, investor community. Um, I think in this year's CEO letter, Larry Fink uh, made very clear um, how much how important it is that uh, businesses start really considering, uh, uh, yeah, making kind of an acceleration of of emissions and and really demonstrating the activities that companies are doing to to achieve that really part and parcel of um, businesses' core mission and and their core undertakings. So with all these pressures mounting, um, you know, we clearly need to do a lot. Um, but the problem is, at the moment, in particular, one of the one of the biggest parts of the greenhouse gas emissions actually sits in a company's supply chain. So we heard about the scope one, two, and three emissions earlier, and you know, scope one and two actually make up quite a small amount, a, a kind of small share of the emissions uh, that a company generates. The majority of scope three emissions something which sits outside of uh, outside of the company's boundaries and so something also which which is quite difficult to control and the problem in this space is that there's a, there's it, this is a sort of black box many companies don't really understand what their scope three emissions are kind of on a granular level on a product level um i think you know when when we start talking about emissions transparency a lot of people say well we have emissions transparency we have the greenhouse gas protocol you know we know everything we need, we need to know and it's it's all easy but actually um, when you start looking into the details of, of the footprints of your actual products, um, it quickly becomes apparent that uh, we don't have enough uh, information and we don't have enough kind of in a good enough methodological infrastructure to actually be able to, to calculate those, uh, the, those emissions. So um, there is no consistent methodology uh, for the calculation, meaning that the methodologies which do exist, like the greenhouse gas um, product standards, the ISO standards, uh, the product category rules, which are kind of rules which are designed to, to help you calculate footprints for specific products. They all leave room for interpretation and, um, you know, all kind of for, for different decision points where different companies might take different routes. So you end up with a situation where you don't really have information which, or data which can be really compared because you're not comparing apples with apples. And the other thing is that a lot of the data which is currently actually calculated is also based on secondary data. Uh, so and really, you know, sophisticated models, um, but still not real data um, or on proxies. Um, so in the end, you you know, you don't really know what your actual scope three footprint is. It might be much higher than than you actually are assuming. Um, and then in addition, um, you know, thirdly, um, I think the uh, one of the kind of once you have the information in place, it's also quite difficult to actually get that information to the right people and the people who want it. Um, supply chains are extremely complex. Um, companies are, you know, often are parts of really long supply chains, and getting that information up the supply chain and and, and really kind of to a point where where everyone's uh, data is is bundled is is extremely complex. Made even more difficult by the fact that companies often operate in different technological systems. So all this clearly is a huge hurdle towards creating emissions transparency. And we found ourselves, uh, you know, about a year ago, we found ourselves at this this point where where um, our members of the World Business Council said, you know, we need to work on this because 
if we were having these pressures, we need to increase out the speed of uh, decarbonization, but we can't do that because we can't decarbonize if we don't actually know, um, we can't actually track uh, what we actually what we actually create in terms of emissions. And, you know, so, so how can we even reduce if we don't even know what our emissions are? So it's kind of within the framework of that that we came together under this uh, value chain carbon transparency pathfinder project. And maybe before we go into the details of the project, I'd like to just really briefly um, share some information um, in terms of, you know, what what the things are that you can actually create with emissions transparency. Um, the use cases are really, really broad and they reach from use cases for companies, but also for, for regulators and governing bodies um, and also individuals. Um, there are quite a few examples listed here, so maybe let me just pick out uh, pick out a few. Um, I very briefly mentioned the product labeling. Um, so, you know, if you have all the information in place and you know what, what carbon footprint throughout the whole supply chain, the production of your product actually generates, you can go and put a carbon label on your product. And as a consumer, well, on the one hand, if, you, if you're selling that product, you know, within, within your supply chain, um, companies will make their decision maybe on the basis of that. But as a consumer, an end consumer, like you and me, we will be able to understand what impact our buying decision actually has, which is a huge thing and it's hugely important because, you know, obviously consumers have a lot of buying power and then we can tailor how we buy and, 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 and yeah, help also, you know, set incentives for companies to, to, to be low carbon. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think I mentioned that, that uh, supplier kind of working together with suppliers, figuring out who has high, high carbon products, for example, and helping them decarbonize. Um, or also around innovation in trying to pinpoint where there's areas where low carbon products don't exist yet and how we can actually innovate around that space and create new, yeah, new products. And then maybe one of the other things I'd like to also uh, kind of highlight, having better data will really help also understanding where carbon hotspots are. Um, and, and, and then, you know, help regulators and governments and, and also businesses, of course, to take more targeted action. So those are just some of the uh, some of the key things I, I wanted to highlight um, that we started off with, uh, you know, thinking about when we worked, started our work on the uh, on the value chain carbon transparency pathfinder. And what the pathfinder does, it brings together um, businesses and other stakeholders um, to really unlock um, the big en enablers to uh, de kind of accelerating decarbonization. Um, as I indicated earlier, there's a huge methodological problem, um, but there's also a technological problem. Um, and so what we're working on and kind of the two main um, the kind of yeah, the focus is really to create the infrastructure on a methodological and technological side um, for the sharing of carbon emission data. Um, across you know industries and value chains so the two core deliverables which we set ourselves uh which we set out to resolve with the, with the pathfinder are on the one hand to create a methodology for the calculation and allocation of primary emissions data um really to kind of bring the consistency and accuracy of data on a product level um and building um as as, as much as possible on existing standards um and then also creating a uh, kind of technological framework around that to create a network of networks in which all the different solutions that exist um, can, can kind of interoperate in the manner that you're able to exchange your carbon data from one company to the next without being hindered, um, yeah, hindered in the process of doing so. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a really unique project in the sense that we, as I said, and, and I can't emphasize this enough because I think this is a really common misconception that we work on a product level um, well, you know, organizational footprinting and, and then kind of cascading down in terms of spend analysis and then, and then allocating footprints to your products that, that exist. But we kind of take a bottom up view from really the product level and what does that particular product, what's the footprint of the product itself, what does it, has it created? Um, and also, you know, it's a really unique um, project in the sense that it's actually bringing together companies from one value chain. Um, uh, we've started off with the FMCG. Uh, industry, and I'll show you kind of some of the players in a minute who is involved. But so we have some oil and gas companies, we have some CPG companies, we have some uh, some packaging companies, and, and some chemical companies working together. So it really shows this value chain cross sectorial approach. Um, but it also shows, you know, there are also companies from the same industry working together, of course, in an antitrust uh, safe space. Um, but, you know, kind of really kind of leaving the comp comp competition element at the door and understanding that it's essential if we want to resolve this problem to work on this, on this subject together. 
And I think that the, the last reason why the project is so unique is because we really focus on creating openness and interoperability, especially on the tech side of things. Um, you know, so here's a kind of a small overview of some of the uh, some of the players who've been involved so far. Um, like I said, really a big range of uh, of companies, and we launched our mission paper, which you can find on the WBCSD website, um, in uh, in about March time. And maybe just to you know, kind of to to give a, a bit more background in terms of kind of what drives the project on a day to day basis and how we approach the development of the methodological framework, but also the uh, principles for the network for data exchange. So some of the and, and you know there's a lot of information here. So maybe let me just pick out the the, the key things. Um, as I indicated on the methodological side of things, we want to build on existing standards and methods as much as possible, working very closely um, with the necessary governing bodies um, and, and kind of entities that are that are active in the space to ensure alignment. So for example, you know building on the the product category rules, um, but also the EU PEF legislation and and aligning closely with the EU Commission in that context. Um, building on the ISO standards, building on the, of course, on the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, and as we, uh, you know, kind of currently are very strongly involved in the Secretariat of the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, um, actually the same person sits on my team that sits on the Secretariat um, team uh, from the WBCSD side. So we have very strong links into that as well. Um, and, you know, I think I already mentioned we we focus on uh, the product level. Um, I think I said that several times, but it is a very important point. Um, and we really want to make sure that we, you know, create a system which addresses some of the key concerns around what you do when there are kind of complementary rules, how do you kind of integrate them, um, or the additional guidelines which are kind of relevant from, from, you know, on a sector specific basis. And what data elements do you actually then end up sharing with other companies? How can you create consistency around that? Um, and so that's the kind of on the methodological side of things, some of the questions we're asking ourselves and trying to resolve. And then in terms of the the network for data exchange, um, you know, we're, we're taking at the moment a um, cradle to gate approach. What that means is that you kind of, you know, when you when you get the data in the network, it's the full value chain before you, which comes to you as one footprint. So there's no kind of openness in, at the moment, at least um, of which companies have have which part of the uh, the footprint. I think this is something we're going to be looking into kind of further down the lane. Um, but at least, even if you just have, the, you know, one footprint for your product kind of from the full supply chain that comes before you, that's already hugely uh, valuable and important. Um, and we're also looking at kind of, you know, making sure that um, the data that we, uh, yeah, or the tech part on the tech side of things, that that confidentiality of data and reliability of the system, so kind of through auditing measures, et cetera, is guaranteed. And of course, this interoperability aspect is really big. And what lies at the heart of this interoperability aspect for us really is the fact that we want to make sure that anyone can actually tag into the system as long as they adhere to use the methodology, agree to adhere to the, to the methodology and agree to kind of play by certain, you know, I guess general terms and conditions. Um, but we want to make this a system not just for the big players, but also for the SME players um, and also for many different types of tech players, no matter, you know, startup, established company. That it's really an open system which creates, yeah, or kind of an open. It's in, you know, it's not a solution. It's a it's a network. It's a, it's a kind of it kind of I guess you know I would say it's it's like the kind of like the big factory, and then there's lots of little supply chains in the factory that kind of are moving backwards and forwards, and um, you know, which are powered by the solution providers, and we just provide the building around it, um, and that's really how how we see it. We want to create that space that everyone can come in and kind of be part of the part of the journey. And, you know, we, we started on this work about a year ago and um, over time, you know, we, we very quickly got to the point where we realized how important uh, it actually is to uh, focus on not just what we're doing in our space, but actually to look, look beyond um, the, the FMCG value chain. Um, you know, I think we mentioned this earlier with scope one and two and, and, and scope three. Scope three actually um, is, you know, one of the parts which is or, or kind of emissions in the value chain. They're so interconnected. So one company scope one and two, another company scope three. Many companies operate across value chains, um, but they also operate across industries. So companies will be operating in the oil and gas industry, in the chemicals industry, in in in, in, in the uh, agric agriculture industry, for argument's sake. Um, and, you know, in terms of kind of being linked into players into those industries. So if we create a methodology and a tech infrastructure, which only suits those, you know, kind of industries that we're reflecting at the moment in the pathfinder, then we're actually running the risk 
of not resolving the problem we're trying to solve um, by having kind of one uniform overarching methodology, one network that kind of enables everyone to come together. But we actually create the same problem over again, over and over again, just in a different, I guess, a different, it just looks a bit different. So, you know, we would have a fragmented landscape of different methodological kind of approaches in every single industry. We would have tech solutions, which would be really sophisticated, but only work in a particular industry, for example, or maybe in a couple of adjacent ones. But basically, the ultimate aim of what we're trying to do really wouldn't be achieved. And so that's why we thought, you know, collaboration around this kind of going beyond the, the, the universe that we started off with, but really broad collaboration is so key. Um, and it actually also helps those parties that come into the uh, into the yeah, to, to the table actually also strengthen what they're doing. And so with that kind of in mind, we set out, um, it's, it's a week ago now that we launched the Carbon Transparency Partnership. And the Carbon Transparency Partnership really is designed um, to kind of connect the dots and create alignment um, on the way forward, um, provide, you know, an exchange, a specific exchange between different initiatives um, working in particular, in particular industry focused topics, um, but also for other companies to come together beyond the FMCG value chain in which we find ourselves. Um, so I just really briefly wanted to kind of um, give you yeah, a brief insight into the, uh, the setup of the partnership. Um, we've created four working groups or work streams, as you want to call them, um, under the head of the Carbon Transparency Partnership. Um, the Pathfinder, uh, the Value Chain Carbon, Carbon Transparency Pathfinder, originally sat for this one, within one of our projects called SOS 1.5. But it's now moving kind of next to it because it really is a, is becoming a standalone project, and within it we're housing these these four different work streams. The um, value chain carbon transparency pathfinder will continue to run and continue to drive the objectives it's it's set out to do uh, from the start. Um, but uh, this will be complemented by some activity in different areas. So we're adding the pathfinder activation cluster, which is really designed to focus on implementation and piloting and and taking the work we're doing in the Pathfinder to the kind of broader level to, to enable exchange across different industries on the methodological framework we, for example, are creating. Um, and, you know, I, I, I didn't say this earlier, but for the methodological framework, we've now um, put together a first draft, uh, which we, um, you know, signed up with our members, which we shared for external reviews with bodies like the EU Commission, but also some standard setting bodies, um, some some kind of footprinting organizations, et cetera, some of our friend, friends, so to speak, um, uh, in this in this universe. Um, and, um, you know, the, the Pathfinder activation cluster is, is designed to strengthen that methodological framework and really come in and, and challenge whether it can be applicable across a breadth of industries. And the idea is that this framework or this, me this methodology will form the basis and that every industry then might, you know, kind of create things on top of it, which are which are necessary and relevant for its for, for its industry. So in, oil, in the oil and gas industry, for example, and it's an, it's an example I like to use because it's, it's a fairly clear one. There's a question of co-product allocation. In the automotive industry, there's often questions around, you know, kind of specific part traceability, which are associated to, and which are kind of all come together as part of of having just the footprint, you know, footprint uh, associated with the with the, with the supply chain, but but then there's other information and other kind of yeah I guess capabilities which are needed and the companies they, they want those in addition to to the carbon footprint, and so we want to have this activation cluster which really brings together um, the different industries, the different companies uh, in those industries in particular, and enables us to ask the questions of whether what we're doing you know on the methodological front, but also a little bit on the tech side, whether that actually works, and for the companies to come together and discuss what is actually needed to then implement this. How do we run, you know, what can we run data pilots together? What's needed to do some pilot, piloting on the tech side? And um, we want to do the pilots on the tech side. So it really is the space where, where we define kind of the, the universe of, of making it actually happen and making it practical and making it applicable to many. Um, and then, then that's complement, complemented by some industry deep dives. Um, so there are specific areas where we've been approached or where companies have said, um, or other initiatives have said, you know, we really want to work in that space. Um, there's no one doing anything in the space. Will you will you help us bring together a group? There are some industries where nothing is happening, and we think that the carbon impact is so high that something needs to be done. Um, so this is kind of what the industry deep dives are, are, are trying to target. Um, and then finally, there's this initiatives hub, and the initiatives hub really kind of was born out of the realization that 
there are great initiatives out there working in a in a similar space or you know kind of adjacent spaces um, and, and, and solving topics which are exactly the same or trying to solve exactly the same topic, but trying to solve a topic which is highly relevant, uh, you know, and really sits just next to what we're doing. And, you know, if we're not talking to each other, we're, we're walking in all sorts of different directions. So we've brought, we're, we're bringing together these different initiatives from the chemical industry, from the automotive industries, from the oil and gas industry, from all the different industries. You know, anyone who's out there working on these topics in an industry initiative. Um, and really want to create that alignment and that kind of strength in collaboration. And that's what the initiatives hub will, um, will, will cover. And as I said, the, the core deliverables of the Pathfinder, you know, they really are also the core deliverables of this, this, this partnership with the ultimate aim of, of creating a Pathfinder network, which enables um, scope three value chain transparency. Um, and maybe just before, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time, but um, to kind of before you know, before we kind of come to the end, um, this initiatives hub is where I'm really excited to be working together with Open Footprint, and we've been working together with Open Footprint really um, for a long time now. It's been you know over kind of over I think about six to nine months now that we've collaborated and we've had exchanges on a really regular basis, trying to understand kind of where where we both sit, what we're trying to what we're trying to do, where kind of we end, where Open Footprint starts, where we have to connect and align and also integrate. Um, and you know that's why I'm really pleased that Open Footprint is one of the first initiatives to join us in the Initiatives Hub and to kick the work off in this space. Um, and I think that's going to be a really important uh, work work that we're going to be doing together um, with with these initiatives in order to make sure that we, yeah, like I said, we create uh, good uh, and and useful scope three emissions transparency. So to, to kind of wrap up, and uh, if there are any questions, of course, uh, I haven't been monitoring the chat, but I'm sure there, there might be a couple of questions. I'm happy to answer those. Um, but maybe just to wrap up, um, if you'd like to get involved, um, you can find information on the, uh, the Pathfinder mission paper and also the, um, the Carbon Transparency Partnership on the WBCSD website, and my contact details are there as well. So do feel free to reach out if you would like to find out more or you would like to join any of these, uh, these ongoing work streams um, and help us create emissions transparency going forward. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Um... Uh, we've got two questions, uh, Anna. I'll read them out to you, maybe. Anna, wonderful presentation. Thanks. You talk on principles, slide 46, as created to, to gate. What about end of life product? Like dispose the product and impact. So there might be a product which is friendly GHG to produce, but isn't friendly to dispose. So what about cradle to grave? I think it's a, that's a really uh, important question. It's one we're starting to kind of uh, talk about a little bit more in our methodological uh, group. Um, I think one of the difficulties of kind of end of life is is you know kind of the it's it's not so easy to I guess to to, to kind of uh, get right. And um, the the feeling was initially that um, you know and, and this is how the kind of process we've been taking all along with with the Pathfinder project and we will also take with the partnership. Is that we kind of go bit by bit, uh, in the sense that you know cradle to gate is great, gate to gate would be even better, and of course cradle to gate is great, cradle to grave would be even better. So okay. I think we're trying to solve the the kind of challenges bit by bit, and together with the group we prioritized at the beginning, um, but we will be uh, also looking into this topic um, in the course of time and, and to see how how and if you know we resolve this within the methodology or not. Yeah, well, thank you. The second and then the other question, I've just opened the chat. So okay, I can go see ahead, go ahead, you can see that. Go um, ahead. Yeah. yeah, so I think that um, uh, in terms of kind of engagement and sectors and geographies, um, we are um, currently mapping um, the, the kind of sectors in more detail to figure out where, where there is kind of lower engagement and where kind of, you know, uh, companies are, are, are less, less keen. There are some sectors where um, that seem quite advanced, where there's kind of not as much need um, to kind of do something. So the engagement towards us obviously is a little bit lower. Um, but I can't pinpoint any specific areas at the moment in terms of where we really need to up the, the engagement because um, um, we're, we're currently still in the process of mapping it. Um, but I do think that it's important to make sure that um, all the, you know, every, I mean, every industry somehow is connected to the next. So the broader the engagement is that we can create and the more companies we can get from the more diverse set of industries, the better, because the stronger the methodology will be that we will have. On the flip side, of course, there are some industries which are going to be much more powerful and kind of much more, like, are going to be able to dictate the tone to other industries much more. 
So I think it's also a question of having those core, you know, and key industries. And I don't want to discriminate against anyone because I think it's definitely important to have everyone as part of this. But but I do think that, you know, if you have some of the key industries and some of the key actors across the whole board game involved, um, that already is an important step. And, and that's why alignment and and interaction and, you know, also in the policy side, but also initiatives, all this is such is really at the heart of what we're trying to do with this partnership. Um, because we think that the the strength definitely comes in masses here, um, and 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 that's the you know and, and the credibility and 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 that's how you know how standards are developed really um, by having kind of general consensus around the need to, to to resolve something and then finding a joint way to to do it. So that's really what we're trying to do. It's one other question there. Let's just edit the other. Oh. I want comment maybe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. No, very, very interesting, uh, Philip, to, to hear that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, uh, do feel feel free to reach out if if you want to understand how you can uh, how you can um, become involved and uh, you know how what role your industry might play. Thank you, and thank you uh, very much, Anna. That was very interesting, and we're looking forward to continuing our partnership and discussions and uh, integrating both the Pathfinder and the Open Footprint Forum platform as well.